If you or a loved one is living with cancer, you probably have two focal points, how to rid yourself of it and how to prevent it from coming back. You'll get some terrific information today on Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger. We'll explore natural medicines which may enhance conventional therapies, share cutting-edge research, and offer insight on how diet and natural medicines can play an important role in treating and preventing cancer. The information presented herein is in no way intended as a substitute for medical counseling. Now, here is Dr. James Belanger. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Cancer Concepts and Compliments. I'm your host, Dr. James Belanger. Today we're going to continue our discussion on how cancer cells become resistant to chemotherapy. We we talked a little bit about this last week and we're going to continue that discussion. This is a really important topic to discuss because unfortunately um, today, if you have stage 4 cancer, um, many types of cancers are not curable by chemotherapy alone. We discussed just just a few um, right now that can be cured by chemotherapy alone if it is advanced like testicular cancer or lymphoma. But a lot of the uh, more common cancers from breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, when it gets into the more advanced stages that chemotherapy at best shrinks the cancer for a period of time and then it starts to grow again. But there's been a whole host of research studies being done on natural medicines combined with conventional chemotherapies that may make chemotherapy work better by addressing all the different resistance mechanisms. So that's the purpose of this show today is to discuss all the research that has been done. It's mostly in animal models, unfortunately, but the animal models and the animal studies have been very encouraging and there's been some human studies. And I I hope that uh, more research will be done um, so we can, you know, get some better results. But um, yeah, last week I gave you a little picture to, to to think about on how cancer can become resistant to chemotherapy. I asked you to think about um, all the different techniques you use to keep water out of your basement. That you build, for example, a, a, a trench around your foundation and you seal your walls off and then you have a pump in your basement to pump the water out and you have a vacuum to vacuum up the water. Um, these are some of the things that cancer can do to become resistant. It actually builds a you know wall around itself called the stroma. It has pumps on the surface of its cell membranes to pump chemotherapy out. If the chemo is to try to get in, it just shoots it back out. And then another thing, if the chemotherapy does get in, it can in essence you know vacuum it up or neutralize it so it doesn't harm it. So that's a little analogy to think about. And now we're going to get into more detail of natural things that have been studied to prevent some of these mechanisms. So this this wall that's around cancer, they call it the the tumor stroma, the stroma or the extracellular matrix. And we discussed last week that it's made up of the same compounds that are found in blood clots. They say that cancer is like a wound that doesn't heal. And so it activates the clotting system. And so you'll see elevated levels Uh, often in people with cancer, of these clotting factors, something called fibrinogen, something called thrombin, something called fibrin monomer, and something called D-dimer. These are uh, compounds that come together and form clots, but the cancer activates this to form a wall around itself. That wall is also made out of things found in scar tissue like collagen and something called fibronectin. So you can just think of it as like, you know, like a brick wall, a bunch of bricks, different types of bricks made up of things like this fibrin and collagen, all cemented together by this stuff called fibronectin. So it's a really important thing to, you know, I measure, and there's research on this, measuring some of these clotting factors in people. Because um, cancer can put somebody at risk for a clot, and that's that's sometimes how people present. They have a a stroke or something, or they get a blood clot in their lung. And if if you you have that, it needs to be investigated what caused that. And sometimes it's some hidden cancer somewhere in the body, like colon cancer or pancreatic cancer, and it activates the clotting system, and the person is getting a clot, and then they find the cancer. But measuring these things in the blood, measuring fibrinogen is really important. There's there's a handful of studies that say that people that have high levels of this fibrinogen have a more poor response to chemo and that possibly lowering the fibrinogen might make chemo work better. Because fibrinogen and some of these other things in the blood, you can think of thicken the blood, like, like almost like make the blood like mud. 
And so if you're traveling down a river and you're headed towards a cancer cell and the river gets all muddy and you're the chemotherapy, you can't really get there as easily. But if all of a sudden the uh, river becomes less viscous, then you all of a sudden can start moving towards it. And that's what fibrinogen, elevated levels of fibrinogen and this thrombin stuff and fibrin monomer do to the blood near the cancer is it could make it thicker and more viscous and the chemo can't penetrate as well. And then we talked about last week that, that the blood vessels that feed tumors are different than regular blood vessels. They're more leaky. They have like holes in them, like a, a garden hose with a bunch of holes. And this fibrinogen and this thrombin stuff leaks out of the blood vessels only near the cancer because the cancer blood vessels are different. And it deposits around the cancer, forming this stroma. So we talked about that, that um, you know, ginkgo has been studied, uh, a couple human studies showing that it might make chemo work better, possibly by improving blood flow. Uh, we talked about fish oil. There's an animal study on that. And we talked about niacinamide, a B vitamin. Um, but there's also research showing that, you know, anticoagulants, other anticoagulants can help. And this one, it's a, it's a natural anticoagulant produced in our body called heparin that is used to uh, flush people's ports. But there's research showing that a daily injection of heparin might make chemotherapy work better. There was a study done in 2004 in Turkey um, published in the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. It showed that patients with lung cancer had a, an improved response when they combined chemotherapy with this blood thinner heparin. And I'm talking about a daily injection of heparin, not just a heparin given before chemo to flush the port. A daily small dose of subcutaneous heparin increases the response to chemo in this one study from 42.5% to 69.2%. And then it not only in, improved the response rate, but the, um, per, the time to progression improved too, going from six months to 10 months. So greater response rate and it lasted longer with that simple thing. And the mechanism of action is possibly by improving chemo delivery. Um, natural things, there are natural things besides you know heparin that can help uh, thin the blood a bit to help improve chemo delivery. They unfortunately don't have human studies on them. Um, but they're very well tolerated, and it would be a, very useful to do more research on them. But um, if a patient has a high fibrinogen level in the blood, um, I have found that this herb called Boswellia um, is very good for lowering it. Boswellia is uh, frankincense. It's an Indian herb, and they use that a lot. It's, it's used to treat uh, arthritis and asthma. There's a bunch of human studies on it. There's even human studies done in, in people with brain tumors showing that Boswellia can help improve uh, uh, the edema, the swelling. Um, but in terms of its effects on chemotherapy, I haven't seen anything. But it's very good for lowering fibrinogen or normalizing fibrinogen and uh, needs to be further studied. There's also these different um, enzymes that are found in uh, foods and, and other products. Um, that There's one called lumbrokinase. It's actually an enzyme found in earthworms. And uh, then there's something called natokinase. It's an enzyme produced by a bacteria that, that they use to make um, a, a Japanese food called natto. It's a fermented soy product, but it's actually produced by a bacteria. Well, the, both of these compounds, lumbrokinase and natokinase, have been you know, studied to help normalize fibrinogen levels and improve blood flow. They haven't been studied with chemotherapy, but um, I have found clinically that they're excellent for helping to lower fibrinogen levels in somebody that has elevated levels and is at risk for a clot. And like I mentioned, the fibrinogen may impair the delivery of chemo. So it's something that needs to be looked at. But it's interesting, in China, in China um, you know, they've been using earthworms for years for something called blood stagnation. You know, so you can think of it as stagnant blood or thick blood. And then just recently, they determined that it was because of this enzyme in earthworms called lumbrokinase that helped. And then same thing, this natokinase, something, you know, found in this food, natto, uh, this fermented soybean product, um, that they found that this enzyme also helps discourage clots and could help possibly reduce risks of strokes and heart attacks. Um, besides this fibrinogen, there's also this, this compound found in the blood called thrombin. And it activates fibrinogen into something called fibrin. So you can think of fibrinogen as, a, as one of the bricks. And thrombin 
gets together with the fibrinogen and turns the bricks into a brick wall. And so thrombin is something also I measure in patients with um, cancer because there's research showing that thrombin, when it's elevated, people tend to have a worse prognosis. Cancer can be more aggressive and advanced Thromb- because thrombin is part of making the stroma. Thromba- thrombin activates blood vessel growth factors. It makes cancer more invasive. And um, garlic has been shown to help lower thrombin. You know, just eating fresh garlic or their garlic pills has been shown to help thin the blood, you know, and, and it would be very indicated for somebody with an elevated thrombin level. Um, it can normalize thrombin and might help make chemotherapy work better. And it does have some direct anti-cancer effects too. They've studied garlic um, in animals with bladder tumors, showing that it helps reduce the risk of reoccurrence after surgery in animals with bladder tumors. So garlic has a lot of potential too. And then once this wall is made, you know, we've talked about things that might prevent it from forming, but once it's made, um, something that might break it down. Well, it is made up of fibrin, and fibrin is like that brick wall. And there are enzymes that have been shown to, they call it fibrinolytic, breaking down fibrin, and fibrin is composed of this fibrinogen. And 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 an enzyme that that I've seen um, be helpful for helping to decrease fibrin production and fi- and breaking down fibrin is called serapeptase from silkworms. There's a, a bacteria that lives in in silkworms called serratia, and it produces this enzyme called serapeptase. And serapeptase um, can, has been studied to break down fibrin. Fortunately, it has not been shown to make chemotherapy work better. They haven't done that, but the research says that you know, fibrin levels, high fibrinogen, high thrombin, all those things can impair chemo delivery. So it's something that needs to be looked at more. But heparin, which is a, a blood thinner, has been studied in people with lung cancer and shown to improve response rates. So it's a, a, an area that needs a lot more attention. So that's kind of mechanism one, is improve chemo delivery by affecting this stroma. And so now we go back to that analogy of water coming to the basement. So Okay, the waters came through our barrier. Now what do we do? We, we pull out our pumps and we pump that water out so it won't get into our basement. Well, that's what the cancer cells do. Step number two is if the chemo does get through their barrier, they have these pumps. And there's, there's two main pumps. One pump, it's called the MRP pump, the multi-drug resistance protein pump. And the other, the other pump is called the P-glycoprotein pump. These are the two main pumps that are that can be expressed on the surface of cancer cells, and they lead to resistance. So a, a cancer that's becoming resistant to chemo will start to upregulate these pumps so that it's ready for the chemo and shoots it right back out. And they found that there are some chemotherapies that will get pumped out by that first pump I mentioned, that multidrug resistance protein, the MRP pump. And they include adriamycin, which is a, a common you know, breast cancer drug. And it's also used for like liver cancer, for example, and they sometimes use it in, um, uh, as a second or third line therapy for ovarian cancer. Platinum drugs, carboplatinin, common drug used with ovarian cancer and lung cancers, oxaliplatinin with, with um, colon cancer, um, a drug called CPT11 also used with colon cancer, vincristine, you know, another common drug being used for cancer. And um, these are the main ones. And they... When they enter a cancer cell, if a cancer cell starts to upregulate this MRP pump, it will, in essence, take the adriamycin or that carboplatin and shoot it back out. And it actually takes and, and adds something to the chemo called glutathione. And then that complex of the glutathione with the chemo binds to the pump, activates the pump, and out it goes. So it can't harm the DNA of the cancer cell. The cancer cell will not die if the DNA... Um, doesn't get reached and and affected by the chemotherapy in some way. So it first has to get through that the cell membrane and through the pump. The P-glycoprotein pump, which is the other main pump, imparts resistance to other types of drugs, like the taxanes, they call them, like taxol, common drug used for lung cancer or for breast cancer, and, and docetaxol or taxotere, a drug being used for some types of breast cancer now and um, metastatic prostate cancer that doesn't respond to hormone therapy. So this P-glycoprotein is really responsible for pumping out those taxanes, those taxol-like 
drugs and a drug called etoposide, which is used for some types of lung cancer and stuff. Not, not a common one used, but it, it's in there. And then something called vinca alkaloids. Like there's a drug called navel bean, which is being used for like breast cancer when it um, um, doesn't respond to drugs like Taxol and stuff. So it's another thing that um, needs to be inhibited, another pump. So I'm going to talk to you about there's two compounds found in green tea that actually can inhibit these pumps. So the first thing in green tea um, that inhibits one of these pumps, it's called theanine. And it has been shown in animal studies to inhibit the MRP pump. So I mentioned this MRP pump um, pumps out drugs like cisplatin and carboplatin, and it it needs this thing called glutathione to activate. So as the chemo comes into the cancer cell, the cancer cell adds this thing called glutathione, and then that attaches to the chemo, activates the pump, and the pump shoots it back out. Well, theanine in these animal studies have been shown to, in essence, kind of block the production of this thing called glutathione in cancer cells because theanine is the chemical name for it is called ethyl glutamate. It is a compound found in green tea. It's also found in like porcini mushrooms, but it contains these natural, this natural ethyl glutamate, it's called. And it actually blocks what's called glutamate transporters on cancer cells. And glutamate is needed to make glutathione. And so the cancer can't make the thing that it needs to activate the pump. And that's possibly how it works. So it's actually been shown to reduce this glutathione. And so um, this doctor, these doctors in Japan, Dr. Saduka from Japan and Dr. Sugiyama has published a whole bunch of studies. They're all animal, unfortunately, on theanine with chemotherapy. And they found that when they gave theanine along with drugs like doxorubicin, which is adriamycin, that breast cancer drugs, drugs like idorubicin, which is sometimes used with leukemia, cisplatin, and irinotecan, it doubled the concentration of the chemo inside various types of tumors that they studied. Doubled the concentration. And even better yet, it decreased the tumor weight in the mice from between 30 and 75%. So it not only allowed the chemo to get in the cancer cells better, but it made the chemo work better. And what's really interesting is it did not increase side effects of the chemo. It actually decreased the concentration of the chemotherapy in tissues like the heart and the bone marrow and the lung and the intestine and the liver and concentrated the chemotherapy in the uh, cancer cells themselves. And then on top of it, it reduced the spread of the cancer to places like the liver. And the added benefit of the theanine is that it seems to also help the immune system. That, now, they have actually studied that in people. Um, there's a study done at, at Harvard where they gave people uh, tea that, that they had measured the amount of theanine and found that the natural killer cells had worked better. So it has kind of a twofold effect, might make in chemotherapy work better and at the same time help the immune system. And this is important because adriamycin, for example, has a response rate in, say, like sarcomas. is this cancer called sarcoma of only about 12%. And then the, that 12% will progress within a year. Or patients that are given adriamycin that have advanced um, uh, ovarian cancer have a response rate of 18% if they've tried this adriamycin after chemo carboplatin and taxol doesn't work and then it, it it only works for a few months so it's a really you know something that needs more research more human studies on this this did this dr saduka's findings can they be duplicated in people well we're going to stop right here for the moment and take a little short break this is cancer concepts and compliments i'm your host dr james belanger when we come back we're going to talk about another compound in green tea to help make chemotherapy work better This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger. The information presented herein is in no way intended as a substitute for medical counseling. If you would like to find out more about the Lexington Natural Health Center, please visit LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. That's LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. Okay, welcome back to Cancer Concepts and Compliments. This is your host, Dr. James Belanger. 
Before the break, we were just finishing up a top topic called um, theanine, a compound found in green tea to make chemotherapy work better. And, was, and we mentioned that the that it inhibits this pump called the MRP pump, the multi-drug resistance protein. It's a pump on the surface of cancer cells that pumps out the chemotherapy as it tries to enter the cancer cell. Well, besides this compound theanine, there's also been research done on a mineral, selenium, the mineral selenium affecting this MRP pump. And there's actually been some human studies done on this. Before I get into the human studies, so there's this mineral called selenium, and it exists in the soil, and it's found in some foods. It's found in, in like Brazil nuts. It's found in mushrooms, porcini mushrooms, asparagus. It's in garlic. And, and then it's also in the soil. And, but the plants take it out of the soil and convert it into these organic forms. One's called selenomethionine and the other is called methyl selenocysteine. These are forms that are made in these plants like the Brazil nuts and the garlic and the asparagus that it takes it from the soil. Those are the ones that have been studied to help make chemotherapy work better, at least to affect this pump. And so there's been numerous studies done, starting with some animal studies, all being done in um, this uh, uh, university in New York. I can't remember, uh, Rochester or something. Um, but in, in, in this journal, Cancer Letters, in 2011, they took these animals, and for seven days they gave them one of these forms of selenium, the selenomethionine and the methyl selenocysteine. And it increased the concentration of chemotherapy. The chemotherapy drug that they tested was irinotecan a drug used in colon cancer. It increased it in the cancer cells by about 50%, but it did not increase the concentration of the chemo in the bone marrow of the intestine. And this is the same, like, like I mentioned with theanine. Theanine had the ability to increase the concentration of chemotherapy in cancer cells, but not in healthy cells. And that's really important because you don't want the chemo to increase in there as well because then it can cause more toxicity. But no, it actually it favors the cancer cells somehow. And so in these animal studies, they found response rates were increased to chemotherapy from 35 to 100%, depending upon what cell type that they had tested. And then it also made the blood vessels more mature in the cancer cells. Remember, I mentioned that blood vessels become more, they're more leaky in cancer cells. They're more porous. And when they leak, they leak out that, those stroma components and those surround the cancer preventing chemotherapy from, from being delivered. So that might be another mechanism. It actually improves the maturity of the blood vessels, making them less leaky, and that can help also make chemotherapy work better. Um, it's also been studied with drugs like adriamycin, which is a, a breast cancer drug, and cisplatin as well. And it did not de increase the toxicity in the kidneys or the heart of, with those two drugs. Those adriamycin can affect people's hearts, and cisplatin can affect the kidneys. Well, the selenium added actually decreased the toxicity in these animal models. But this is one that actually has had some human studies. Back in 2006, they did a small study, and it was published in Clinical Cancer Research 2006. They took eight patients with colon cancer, and one patient um, had, had colon cancer. I, I, actually, a bunch of them had colon cancer that spread to the liver. But one of the patients, and all these patients, by the way, were not responding to the chemotherapy irinotecan. It wasn't working anymore. They were progressing. And because of the animal studies showing that selenium might work better, they picked these people and they added selenium to it. And one of the patients out of the eight started having a response again to the irinotecan. And that response lasted for another six cycles. She had had four cycles of, of irinotecan. The cancer was progressing. All they did was add selenium. And it started to respond again, started to shrink again, last for another 10 cycles, and then it stopped working. And she was the smallest of the patients. So she uh, you know, had a, a lower surface area. And so um, they probably dosed her at a good level. And the other patients were larger than her and were not on a high enough level, possibly, of the selenium. So that might be a reason why she responded better than others. So they're, they're doing more research on it um, to uh, confirm if, if, it, if it's um, working as good as those animal models. So that's really great because irinotecan, the drug for colon cancer, 
um, when they combine it with 5-FU, if you have metastatic colon cancer, only you know works in about 30% of the patients and only shrinks the cancer in 30%. And then that effect usually lasts like seven months. So if something as simple and cheap as selenium can make it work better, combine that with theanine and, and, and some other things that I'm going to mention today, um, we, we, we might take a cancer that's more resistant and make it more susceptible. So the next pump that I talked about, there's this other pump that pumps out chemotherapy called the P-glycoprotein pump. And it has been shown to be inhibited by another compound found in green tea called EGCG. There's this other compound called EGCG, has this big long name, I won't even bother trying to pronounce, but it has been shown in animals to inhibit this P-glycoprotein pump. And so it has been studied with drugs that get pumped out by the P-glycoprotein pump. Um, namely, one is called adriamycin. Adriamycin, like we said, is a common drug used in breast cancer, but it's also used for primary liver cancer, like a, a liver cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma. And in, in the International Journal of Oncology in 2010, they gave mice this EGCG compound. So it's a purified green tea supplement in a pretty high dose. So it wasn't like just giving them green tea. They took this compound from green tea, purified it, and gave them that thing. And that is available. Um, it's called T-Vigo is one company that, that will have it. They, they call it T-Vigo, but it's EGCG. And they gave it orally to these mice with the adriamycin, and the adriamycin worked twice as good as it, you know by itself at shrinking these liver tumors. And how did it work? It doubled the concentration of the chemotherapy in the cancer cells, but it did not increase the concentration in drugs in the organs like the heart. Adriamycin has a, an affinity for the heart. You, even if you're responding to it, you can't have too many cycles of adriamycin because it builds up in the heart, um, and um, so you know that's a, a trouble with it. So, you know, they usually just do four cycles for breast cancer and then, then they stop and they always check your heart ahead of time to make sure that you can handle it. But for, for you know, sarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas, you know, they, they have to, they remain on adriamycin and if, if it's starting to affect the heart, then they have to stop it even if it was working. Well, here we got EGCG, I mentioned theanine. They both might decrease the concentration of the adriamycin in the heart and at the same time increase the concentration in the cancer cells. So that's uh, something, again, that needs a lot more studies. There's more research also being done on other drugs that get pumped out by the P-glycoprotein pump. A drug called Taxotir, or Docetaxol is the other name for it. And it is being used for some types of breast cancer, and they use it for prostate cancer in men that aren't responding to the hormone-lowering therapy. Well, so this study did, did, took Docetaxol, or Taxotir, combined it with the EGCG from the green tea, in, in animals with prostate cancer. And it was published in the Journal of Translational Oncology in 2011. And it enhanced the effectiveness of the taxotere. And it helped increase the concentration of the taxotere in the prostate cancer cells. Um, and so the mice, uh, none of them had survived past two weeks with this prostate cancer. They, you know, these mice models, they inject cancer into them um, in high doses and stuff like that. So it's like a, getting a massive influx of cancer. So they, um, it's always a little more aggressive than, than what it might be in your body where it's slowly forming. But they inject it. None of the mace live past two weeks, um, but they survived for at least 12 weeks with the EGCG. More than 90% survived so, um, with the chemotherapy. So it improved the taxotere in that animal study much better than taxotere alone. And this is important because, like I said, taxotere is used for prostate cancer, but once the prostate cancer becomes resistant to hormone therapy, taxotere only works in about 44% of people with prostate cancer, um, and uh, it shrinks it. And then median survival is 13 months. So if, if um, something as simple as green tea might make it work better, that would be something to look into further. It's been studied for Taxol with breast cancer. Taxol is another drug that gets pumped out by the P-glycoprotein pump, common drug used in breast cancer. Um, typical you know, human studies showing that Taxol works about 42% of the time. It's shrinking cancer in women with metastatic breast cancer. And then it starts to progress nine months later. 
So, you know, something that could make it work better is definitely um, needs to be researched. EGCG in animal models has been shown to help improve that. Where they gave EGCG plus Taxol, breast cancer to these animals. After 28 days, the tumors were one half to one third the size in the group given green tea EGCG with the Taxol than Taxol alone. One half to one third the size. They only carried it out a lot. That's the problem with a lot of these animal studies. They probably don't have a lot of money to fund them. They carry them out for a month, you know, not not that long. And they see that, okay, it improves. But we don't always know just, you know, how long that effect's going to last. So some serious money needs to be dumped into research on natural things because there's really promising animal studies where they're given these things orally in doses that um, can certainly be achieved in people. And they're getting these results like this. Um, but the big question is, will this is this the case for people? And will you know will this be a long-lasting effect? Because they're not doing these studies for that uh, long of a period. Um, we need more money, and and you know some people unfortunately don't have time for waiting these studies. These natural compounds are available, and the animal studies are looking promising. A lot of these are pretty well tolerated. I mean, they're not full, you know free of side effects. Green tea can cause nausea in people, um, but and it might raise liver enzymes. I really haven't seen that, but it's been reported to raise liver enzymes. But you monitor those things and, and adjust dosages accordingly. Um, so they, they're very well tolerated, a lot of these supplements, and um, it's, uh, people can't wait for these human studies. So somebody needs to do them soon and fast to help, help these people with these more advanced cancers. Uh, the a third thing, or a fourth thing actually, that can actually help reduce these pumps is a compound found in grapes called resveratrol. You know, you might have heard it's in you know red wine and stuff. It's also in chocolate, but they've done research on resveratrol to with the adriamycin, showing that it makes the adriamycin inhibit the growth of uh, tumor uh, uh, cancers by about sixty percent compared to controls. And what's Nice about the resveratrol, it does appear to affect both those pumps that I talked about, both the MRP pump and the P glycoprotein pump when given orally. It was shown to downregulate those and make chemotherapy work better. Resveratrol, however, is not indicated for every type of chemo. For some reason, it does make, it interferes with Taxol. So there is research showing that resveratrol with Taxol might not be a good combination. But at least with adriamycin, it, it's looking very promising. So that's the second mechanism, is inhibiting the pumps. The third thing is there are some special types of chemotherapies. When they start to enter the cancer cell, they don't necessarily uh, stay in the cancer cell. They can kind of wash out. They're not pumped out, but they just don't you know, stay in. They need to kind of be locked in. And there's this, these two chemotherapy drugs. One's called Olympta and the other is called methotrexate. When these drugs enter a cancer cell, the cancer cell or should or needs to combine, combine something called glutamate. And when glutamate combines with Olympta and methotrexate, it forms these, they call them polyglutamates. And then the drugs are active. They're not active if these glutamates are not added to the chemotherapy. Once the chemotherapy is activated, then it can inhibit the DNA of the cancer cell and kill the cancer cell. And it will stay inside the cancer cell too. If there's no glutamates added, it will wash out of the cancer cells. And so um, this is a really important thing to do um, is to make sure that the cancer is adding these glutamates. And so cancer cells will downregulate enzymes that add glutamates so it won't activate, we won't be activated. And then the chemotherapy will flush out. So there happens to be a, a research study saying, well, what happens if we add something that increases glutamate levels in cancer cells? Will that help make this drug methotrexate work better? So in the Journal of Anals of Surgery, they took uh, rats and they gave them this cancer called a fibrosarcoma. And then they gave them glutamine with this drug called methotrexate, or they gave them methotrexate alone. They just carried out this study for two days, two days well, two days of glutamine and one day of the methotrexate. And then they killed the rats and they see what, what happened. Well, they found out that the glutamine increased the concentration of methotrexate in the cancer cells by over threefold. 
and it increased the activated form of the methotrexate by 14-fold. So it helped lock the methotrexate in the cancer cells, keeping it from getting washed out. And it caused a 20% reduction in the tumor volume, just this one dose. And this is a very resistant. Sarcomas tend to be very resistant to chemotherapy. So this, this is a, a very interesting study where there was no response to the methotrexate when it was given by itself. Methotrexate really isn't used very much um, nowadays, but you'll see it um, sometimes used for lymphoma that's in the brain, the CNS lymphoma. They'll take the methotrexate and instill it into the, the, uh, the fluid around the brain to help with lymphoma. And um, this type of lymphoma, the response to methotrexate is about 75%. So it has a, a decent response rate, but people start to progress after 13 and a half months. Glutamine does cross the blood-brain barrier, and it, there needs to be research showing if glutamine added to methotrexate might make that 13 and a half months longer and maybe the response rate higher than the 75%. That animal study um, did suggest that. The other drug that is, um, it's in the same category of methotrexate that's being used a lot more now. It's called Olympta, Olympta. It's a pretty new drug, so I haven't seen any research done pairing um, glutamine with Olympta, but it is in the same family. It needs to be activated just like methotrexate into this glutamate form to be, to be active. And it's being used for lung cancer right now. And with people with metastatic lung cancer, when it's combined with carboplatin, only 50% or so respond, and it only works for four to seven months. So glutamine needs to be looked at more. It's been shown in animals to make methotrexate work better. It might make Olympta work better. Okay, we're going to take another break right now. This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments. I'm your host, Dr. James Belanger. When we get back, we're going to talk about copper-lowering therapy to make chemotherapy possibly work better. This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger. The information presented herein is in no way intended as a substitute for medical counseling. If you would like to find out more about the Lexington Natural Health Center, please visit LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. That's LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. Welcome back, everybody. This is the show Cancer Concepts and Compliments. I'm your host, Dr. James Belanger. Before the break, we were talking about the effects of glutamine possibly making methotrexate, the drug methotrexate, work better. Um, now we're going to switch to another topic um, or another uh, chemotherapy. There's this chemotherapy drug called Eris-C or cytarabine that's being used for leukemia. And it also has a special mechanism of resistance. It works great for leukemia initially, but then the leukemia gets around it, becomes resistant, and then it stops working. And so this is something that needs to be explored more. Well, this ERA-C or the cytarabine, the, the chemotherapy or the cancer cell, should I say, gets fooled thinking that it is a compound of DNA. So it starts to uptake this ERA-C, uptake it, thinking that it's DNA, and then it goes to convert it into DNA and finds out, oh, no, that's not really DNA, that's a poison, and then the cancer cell dies. So it's kind of like an analogy, like, okay, you see a, a glass of this clear liquid and you think it's water and you go to drink it and, oops, you know, it's rubbing alcohol. Well, okay, what do you do? What do you do? You, you well, you induce vomiting, try to throw it up, or you try to dilute it out, drinking, you know, water, actual water to dilute it out. Well, that's what cancer cells do, is if when they start to uptake this era C and they realize, whoop, that's not the right stuff, they will start to um, you know, really upregulate the uptake of DNA fragments that are around the cell. You know, you know, cells are dying all the time, so there are these fragments of DNA lying around in the blood or around, cancer, around cells that can be um, imported in to be converted into DNA. So they call this the salvage pathway. It's like trying to salvage itself or save itself by importing something that is of compounds of DNA to dilute out the era C or flush it out. And so this is what they found that EGCG from green tea, another, another mechanism of action for this green tea compound, that if they gave EGCG two hours after era C or cytarabine, it doubled the survival of mice with leukemia by blocking the uptake 
of the DNA precursors. So it, in essence, you know, as the cancer is reaching for that glass of water, the analogy to dilute out the ARIS-C, the EGCG got in the way and said, nope, you can't have that. And the ARIS-C was not diluted out and was able to continue to work. So this is really important because, um, you know, like I said, leukemia patients can become resistant to that. And once they become resistant to ARIS-C, uh, according to the data, medium overall survival may be 3.9 months, but it might range from 1 to 20 months when AML becomes resistant to the, um, the ARIS-C and, and this other drug, doxorubicin or danorubicin. And EGCG, we talked in a, an earlier part that makes that drug work better too. So it would be a really good thing to do more research on that one. Okay, the, another thing is... It's kind of similar to this ARIS-C pathway. There's this drug, you know, cisplatin and carboplatin and oxaliplatin. When they come into the cancer cell, um, they interact with the DNA. And they actually come into the cancer cell through the same thing that transports copper. The same thing that transports copper. And so there's been some research showing that if you possibly chelate or remove copper from the body and from the cancer cell then more of the chemotherapy you can get in because it's not sharing that door with anything else. So normally the platinum drugs come into the cancer cell the same way the copper comes in the cancer cell. The copper is being used by the cancer to make blood vessels, stimulate blood vessel growth and make it more invasive. And you know so that comes in. The cancer really wants that, doesn't want the platinum drugs. And so if it starts uptaking a lot of copper, and that, in essence, keeps the oxaliplatin and, and those platinum drugs from coming in. So there happens to be this, this compound called tetrathiomolybdate, tetrathiomolybdate, that has been shown to chelate or remove copper from the body and from cancer cells. And because copper shares transport with the oxaliplatin, when copper levels are lowered in the cancer, there's less of that competition for that transporter and more of the platinum drugs get absorbed. And it's been shown to help increase the effectiveness of, of those platinum drugs in a, in a cancer, cervical cancer was one that was studied. So what is this tetrathiomolybdate? Tetrathiomolybdate is a compound found, formed in the rumens of cows. And it forms when a, an animal is with a rumen is eating soil that contains copper, and sulfur. So if the soil happens to contain, sorry, molybdenum and sulfur, then the bacteria and stuff in the rumens convert the molybdenum and sulfur into this tetrathiomolybdate. Tetra means four, thio means sulfur. Molybdate is a form of the mineral molybdenum. So it's like four sulfurs that the bacteria combine into this molybdenum. So it forms in these stomachs of, of cows. And um, they found that it, it lowers copper in the cow's body. And, and when you lower copper, that causes an anemia and it lowers white cell counts. And so they started studying it for people that there are this genetic condition called Wilson's disease where people do absorb too much copper. And they thought, well, that, that would be a really good thing. And it's been shown to be really helpful for that disease. It's a rare disease, but it is uh, something that could be helped by tetrathiomolybdate. Well, then some researchers in Wisconsin found out that um, copper is used by cancer to help make blood vessel growth factors and grow. So they started studying it, and it's been actually published. There's human studies like kidney cancer showing that adding this tetrathiomolybdate might make people with kidney cancer live longer. And now there's this study done on with chemotherapy too. So um, it, it, it's classified as a drug right now, even though it's made in you know stomachs of cows. So it's not like available at a health food store or anything like that. Um, and um, it can work quite good, but it has to be monitored because it does lower copper, and we do need some copper in our body. Copper does make red cells, helps us make red cells. It helps transport iron in our body, and it's needed to make neutrophils or a particular type of white cell. And so this, all the research that's been done on this uh, tetrathiomolybdate, you have to constantly do blood work to make sure that the person's not becoming anemic or the white cells are dropping. So it is something that, that's a little you know, tough to pair with chemotherapy because chemotherapy also can cause anemias and low white cell counts. Um, so it has to be certainly done under the um, supervision of a, of a doctor, and it's only available by prescription anyway. But there's a lot of research being done on it, uh, tetrathiomolybdate, to check out on the website PubMed 
cancerfund.gov. Okay, now another mechanism is that cancer, once now we talked about the pumps, so here comes the chemo, we inhibited the pumps, the chemo is coming into the cancer cell. I gave you an analogy, well, the next thing you do is you take out your vacuum and you vacuum up the chemotherapy. Well, that's kind of what cancer cells do, is if, if they couldn't pump it out and they couldn't keep it from coming in and st- in, um, you know, preventing it from staying in, then they neutralize it or they suck it up so it doesn't do any harm. And there's this compound I already mentioned already once called glutathione that cancer cells will make to neutralize some types of chemo like carboplatinin, oxaliplatinin, adriamycin, cisplatinin, cytoxin, drugs like that. These are drugs that when they enter a cancer cell, they interact with the DNA, creating some kind of damage to the DNA DNA strand breaks and things like it's it's almost like creating knots in the DNA so then the cancer can't divide in half properly and use its DNA. But it first has to come in contact, these chemo drugs have to come in contact with this barrier glutathione. So you can think of it as like a guard inside the the cancer and it comes up to to that. So they have um, been looking at um, things that might lower concentrations of glutathione. Now, I already mentioned theanine has been shown to do this in animal models. When they gave the animals theanine, the glutathione levels were lowered in the cancer cell, but actually raised in the healthy cell. But by lowering in the cancer cell, it helped make the chemo work better. Well, another thing that's been studied is a another form of selenium. Not the selenium I mentioned earlier, but a an, an inorganic form of selenium, the form that you would find in the soil before it gets uptaken into a plant. It's called sodium selenite. It's an inorganic form of selenium, and they've studied it in animals where they gave them cisplatin, and this was studied in cancer chemotherapy and pharmacology in 2000. So they took a group of mice, gave them ovarian cancer, and gave cisplatin. Now, carboplatin or platinum drugs are commonly used for ovarian cancer. They're some of the best drugs for ovarian cancer, but um, ovarian cancer has a habit of becoming resistant to that, and after a, a, it could be a few months to a, a couple of years, then it starts to come back. So anything that makes cisplatin work better against ovarian cancer is definitely needed. Well, so they gave cisplatin by itself, and then they gave cisplatin with selenium. And both groups, the cancer shrunk um, after the first dose. But after the second dose of cisplatin, the group that was just cisplatin alone, the cancer started to grow again and, you know, continued to grow. And when they took out the cancer from the animals, they found that the cancer had upregulated the glutathione. It increased this glutathione. So it's like it, 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 the first dose came in and said, whoa, what was that? And it immediately started producing this, this factor that could neutralize the next dose of cisplatin. So any cell that survived prepared itself for Another dose of cisplatin upregulates the glutathione and that canceled out the second and third doses. However, the group that was given selenium before the first treatment, before the first treat, treatment, the chemotherapy continued to work. It shrunk it the first dose and the second dose and the third dose. And when they take the tumors out of these animals, the glutathione levels were lowered, lowered than even the, the baseline level. And so it prevented and even decreased the amount of glutathione only in the cancer cells, not in the healthy cells. So that's pretty pretty amazing. But I always encourage my patients to come in before starting even the first dose of chemotherapy because, and this is one, one of the studies that really led me to give that advice, after one dose of chemotherapy, a bunch of cancer cells will die, but other cells will start these resistant mechanisms right away, and then the second and third dose might not work as well. If some pretreatment is given before the first dose of these compounds like EGCG, theanine, selenium, that it might allow second, third doses, and other doses to continue to work. So it's something to think about. Um, I, you know, it's a really good thing to see a naturopathic doctor or a doctor trained in natural medicines right at the beginning of a diagnosis. People tend to do better in those cases than come in after having mo- many types of chemotherapy and having very resistant disease and then coming in. The cancer cells, those are the ones that survive. They tend to be a lot more hardy and resistant to all kinds of therapies. Getting cancer when, it, before it's, when it's naive, before it has seen much chemotherapy, 
is when people tend to respond the best. Another thing that um, might make chemotherapy work to work better is a mixture of two vitamins, vitamin K3, vitamin K3, and vitamin C. Okay, now this combination in particular helps increase levels of hydrogen peroxide in cancer cells. Um, free radicals actually kill cancer cells. Free radicals. You, you hear about free radicals being bad, and yeah, they're bad in general. They age us and they can cause cancer, damage our DNA. But on the flip side, when you already have cancer, it's free radicals that can help kill the cancer. Radiation generates free radicals. Um, drugs like adriamycin creates free radicals inside the cancer. And that glutathione thing that I talked about, that's how it protects the cancer cells. It neutralizes the free radicals. Then the free radicals can't damage the DNA of the cancer cell and it doesn't die. And that's why a lot of doctors say don't take antioxidants. Don't take antioxidants with chemotherapy because they might interfere. Well, you know, there are some antioxidants that might interfere, like there's one called NAC or N-acetylcysteine. But there's a lot of things like green tea is, you know, you could argue has antioxidant properties. But if you do research on that on PubMed.gov, you'll find that the research says that it makes a lot of chemotherapies, including like adriamycin, work better. Um, so it's not as simple as avoiding all antioxidants. But vitamin K3, when it's combined with vitamin C, actually is a pro-oxidant and promotes oxidative damage by generating hydrogen peroxide. And in this journal, Current Medicinal Chemistry 2002, it was studied to improve survival of mice given various types of cancers, combined with the drugs cytoxin, vincristine, methotrexate, etoposide. So it's been studied with numerous types of chemotherapy. It's been studied with radiation. It's been shown to make radiation work better. It has also been studied by itself. There's a study in men with prostate cancer given vitamin K3 with vitamin C showing that it, it slowed the progression of the prostate cancer too. But um, this is something that really needs more research. Uh, it, it can make even the drug gemcitabine work better. And gemcitabine, when it's given to bladder cancer um, with cisplatin, the, it only works for about seven months and starts to progress. When they combined it in this animal study, uh, vitamin K3 with vitamin C, the tumors were almost half the size after four weeks of treatment in the K3 and vitamin C group. And so it's not an antioxidant, it's a pro-oxidant. Um, it's generally well tolerated and um, it, it could have some pretty profound effects. Well, I'm sorry to say that's all the time we have today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Next week, we'll finish up with the enhancing the effectiveness of chemotherapy. But I will also start to talk about the immune system. Why, why does cancer, how does it avoid the immune system? Why doesn't our immune system see it? And what we can do to get the immune system to start to see the cancer better. Well, have a happy and healthy week. I'm your host, Dr. James Belanger. Thank you for joining us this week. Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger can be heard live every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We hope to see you next week for another show. Thank you.